present. As Andrew said, this week we're starting a new series in the book of uh, Nehemiah, which is in the Old Testament. What I'm going to do today is give you a bit of a background of where it fits in the history of the Old Testament and an overview of the book. And it would be great, I suggest that you get the book and read the whole book uh, so you, you have an understanding of where we're preaching in in these next few weeks. It's a great story and it's got lots to, we can apply to today. So uh, I'm going to start off with give you a background of where it fits. So a lot of the Old Testament uh, focuses on the, the nation of Israel and what God did uh, with them and through them. Um, they were, uh, God chose them to be a people that worshipped him, the one true God, and to follow him and obey his commands. Uh, around 600 years BC, the southern part of the nation of Israel was uh, defeated and overrun by the Babylonian Empire. Now that southern part of Israel was called Judah. The northern part, which was called Israel, had been overthrown some years before by the empire of Assyria. But about 600 years BC, uh, 600 BC, the southern half, half was overrun. And over the next about 12 years, uh, the people, the Jews in Judah, were taken off into exile and distributed around the rest of the Babylonian Empire. And so that was a, a, a real low point, but it had been prophesied by God that if they didn't obey him, that this would happen. And they, they failed to obey God, and, um, and, and, they, and they were defeated by their enemies and taken into exile. About 539 B.C., the Babylonian Empire itself was overrun and overthrown by the Persian Empire. And a year later, the, the emperor, the king of the Persian Empire, Cyrus, issued a decree to all Jews saying that they could go back to Jerusalem from anywhere in the empire and rebuild the temple and the city. And over a period of about 90 years, uh, in, in four groups, many Jews returned back to Jerusalem and back to Judah, um, back to their homeland. But many Jews didn't go back. They didn't go back to their homeland. Why was that? Well, God had spoken to the Jewish nation as they went into exile uh, through the prophet Jeremiah saying, uh, when you go into exile, settle there, build houses, pray for the cities to which you're exiled and pray for it to prosper. So they settled in exile. They settled where they were because God had told them to. And so for many Jews, where they lived was home. Many Jews had been born in exile. So they, they, they were at home there in the cities, in the empire. And they didn't want to go back. Uh, but they retained their Jewish identity and religion. And, and they remembered the old uh, city. So the, the book of Nehemiah is the story of a man interestingly enough, called Nehemiah. And he was a Jew in exile in, in Babylon, in a city called Susa. And he, this was after the third group of uh, exiles had gone back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, and before the fourth group going back. So I'm going to, uh, that's the background of it. So the Jews have been in exile, and some of them are going back now. And this is the man in, in the Babylonian Empire, not in Jerusalem, at the start of the story. So I'm going to, to give an overview, and I'm going to read a bit from the start of Nehemiah in chapter 1. So, <clears throat> Nehemiah 1, I'm going to read the first four verses. These are the memoirs of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In the late autumn, in the month of Kislev, in the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was at the fortress of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had returned from there, from there from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. They said to me, things are not going well for those who are returned, who returned to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. And then the next verses are the prayer that 
uh, Nehemiah prays. And I'm not going to I'm not going to read that now. We'll cover that later. I'm just going to read the last verse, which should be on your screen now. The last verse of chapter 1 says, In those days I was the king's cupbearer. So this is the background. So in the rest of the book, to give a very quick overview, Nehemiah returns to Jerusalem, and together with the Jews of Jerusalem and many that go back with Nehemiah, they rebuild the walls of the city and improve the city and the life of the city in many ways. There, that's the overview. So, let me just um, <coughs> give a few observations on, on, on this and draw out what applies to us. So, Nehemiah was settled in exile in the Persian Empire now, and he lived in the capital. He was a cupbearer to the king actually the king of the whole empire, the emperor. Uh, <coughs> and he had a gr great job. He, he, the cupbearer to the king wasn't just some minor waiter. It was a very important f official in the king's household. So he had a great job. He had a job, he had a home, he had <coughs> uh, food provided. His life was sorted in exile. There's, for him personally, there was no reason for him to go back to Jerusalem. Life was sorted. But there was something that m kind of messed up this sorted life. And that was that God had a calling on him. He had a calling from God. Now, the story doesn't exactly say that, but I believe that's, and we, as you read it, you'll see that God had got a plan for him and called him. And it happened like this, as we just read. He got some news from his brother. Things are not going well in Jerusalem. The walls are broken down and the gates are burned. It's a disgrace. Now, actually, this isn't news at all. The walls have been broken down and the gates have been burned for over a hundred years before Nehemiah had even been born. But his brothers, was, his brothers said, it's a disgrace. Now, you can look at this news in different, lots of different ways. <coughs> Um, three ways you could look at it. So maybe some of the Jews in Jerusalem would say, well, things are going quite well. The temple has been rebuilt. Jews are back in Jerusalem living there. Yeah, the walls aren't rebuilt yet and the gates are still burned, but progress has been made. Or you could look at it like Hananiah's brothers and his friends looked at it, saying, no, it's terrible. It's a disgrace. The, the walls are still not built up. The gates are broken down. They saw the problem. Or you could look at it like Nehemiah looked, looked at the news. See, he had a vision for Jerusalem. And he knew that the reality of what was happening wasn't the plan that uh, God had for Jerusalem. Uh, <coughs> but the vision that he got wasn't something he saw with his eyes, not even something that was in his mind. The vision that it had got him here, right in his gut. It really grabbed hold of him. He was devastated by this bad news. He took responsibility. He mourned, he fasted, he prayed because it got him right here. It wasn't just, oh dear, it was really devastating for Nehemiah. And that's what vision from God should be. It should be something that gets us here. It's not just looking at a situation and seeing it and saying, isn't it terrible? That can just really be uh, anybody moan about a situation. But for Nehemiah, it was different. He took responsibility. He owned the problem. Um, for Nehemiah, the dissatisfaction was the city wasn't what it, what it should be. He, saw, he had a vision for it. See, the, the city of Jerusalem for the Jews wasn't just a city. It represented so much more. It was the capital. It was where the temple was, which represented the presence of God. God had spoken many things about Jerusalem uh, to be a place of faithfulness, a place of justice, a place where the nations would go to worship and see God. And Jerusalem simply wasn't fulfilling that purpose. So, so Nehemiah... Uh, was upset. He had a vision of what it should be, but he took responsibility. Two words that are key in this. 
vision and responsibility. It's no good just having vision. We have to take responsibility. So what does that mean for us? Because I want to apply this to us. Nehemiah had a vision. He realized he was called to something bigger than himself, bigger than just sorting out his life. As Christians, we are called to something much bigger than ourselves, much bigger than the lives we live and getting that sorted, much bigger than getting a good job, getting a big house, getting a wife or a husband, getting a career. Uh, They're all good things, all gifts that God gives us, but God calls us to be part of something bigger, something eternal. And Nehemiah led a whole load of people to do something bigger than themselves. And we mustn't let the world, the world system, drag into this desire for more. More money, a bigger house, a better career, whatever. Because that will blind us to the more that God wants to do through us. God has got more than just more stuff. He's got more things to do, more things to achieve through our lives we mustn't let the orderliness of life blind us to the bigger picture of what God wants to do for us because life often is very ordinary you get up (coughs) you go to work you go to school you take the kids to school pick them up life is ordinary but in that ordinariness God has got a big plan don't let the ordinariness of life blind us from that Don't get sucked into wanting more. Because if you do, you'll just never be fulfilled. You'll always want a bigger house. And when you've got the bigger house, guess what? You'll want a bigger house still. (coughs) But if we live like that, if we live like the world as Christians, we can live as though God exists to sort out our lives and sort out our problems. And he will. He will help us. But God has got so much more for us. And to live this life, we must have both vision, we must see the bigger thing, and we must take responsibility. Vision can be the easy part. We can see a need. There's a vision for something that needs to happen. We can see a goal. We can see a better possible future. We can see something that we feel must change. And vision often starts with a dissatisfaction that you see something is not as it should be, whether it's social justice, whether it's the church, whatever it is, you see something must change and it drives you to be part of that. Vision, we need to have vision. And secondly, responsibility. And that can be the hard part. It can be really easy and the tendency is to think somebody ought to do something about this situation. The council, the government... The church, the leaders, somebody, anybody, could be you, could be you, anybody but me. Responsibility says, I'm going to do something about this. Even if it starts just with prayer. And Nehemiah said, I'm going to start and do something about this situation. (coughs) So I want to urge you, church, and if you're those that are looking in for the first or second time, have a vision and take responsibility and I think there's two things I want to just there's lots of things we could have a vision for but two things I think we need to have a vision for and take responsibility for because God has a vision for them and these are the church and the kingdom of God I just want to spend a few moments talking about those the church I don't know what comes to mind when you hear hear the word church but let me tell you, God loves his church. When I say his church, I don't mean Christian Life Church or the Baptist Church or Anglican Church or any of those. I'm talking about his church, of which all those churches are part of. He loves his church, the people of God. The Bible says that Jesus gave his life. He died for the church. God talks about the church as his bride about his, as his family, he has great uh, emotional attachment and love for his ter- church. He cherishes his church. And so we should, if we're followers of God, 
we should cherish and love his church. God has a vision for his church. He says he wants to, through the church, demonstrate his wisdom to the whole universe. Through the church. That's the vision. And many other things. Many other things that God has got a vision for the church. In Christian Life Church, <coughs> we try and express that. We have four pillars of our vision. We say we want to be a church that is God-centered, because in the end it's not, about, um, it's not about the structure, it's not about the meetings, it's not about the preaching. It's ultimately about God. Jesus is at the center of the church, and we love God. We want him to be the center of everything we do. We set the other uh, word we use is connect. It talks about us as a community. Church is people, the people of God. We want to build that community. We say, the other word is grow. We want to grow in God. We want to uh, <coughs> grow in our love of God, our love for each other, our, our knowledge of God. We want to grow as a church. And the last word we use is reach. We want to reach out to the world. Um, and, under those words, uh, under those four, uh, four uh, pillars, under the word reach, we have this phrase. We are to be the hands and feet of Jesus in Herefordshire, the nation, and the world. We are, I'll say that again. We are to be the hands and feet of Jesus in Herefordshire, the nation, and the world. And this takes us beyond Christian Life Church and beyond even the wider church in the city or the nation or the world. And it brings to my other point, which is the kingdom of God. God is passionate about his kingdom. God says that, that the glory of God will fill the whole earth. And we're to pray, as Jesus taught us, your kingdom come and your will be done, that's the kingdom of God, on earth as it is in heaven. We want God's rule to be in the whole earth. And, and he, d he means the whole earth, not just somewhere on earth, the whole earth. Geographically, he wants to fill the whole earth with his rule, but not just geographically, every area of society, work and business, and culture and politics, uh, <coughs> every area of life, he wants to be filled with his rule, which is the kingdom of God. We're to bring God's rule, or God's kingdom of love, of peace and joy into the whole world, starting with where we are, in our family, in our school, in our work, in any situation, it is very easy to criticise your manager, the council, the government. But we as a church have a responsibility not only to pray your kingdom come, but to be agents to bring in the kingdom of God where we are and beyond. At least we should pray. It's so easy to criticise, let's pray. So the church and the kingdom are two things I think, well, convinced that we should have a vision for. Nehemiah was a man that had a vision beyond his life for a city a long, long way away that he could have said, that's nothing to do with me. But God put in his heart to do something, to make Jerusalem what it should be. And I want to pray and I want to ask you to have a vision in your heart for the church and the kingdom of God to be all that God's intended to be and take responsibility for it. And I'm exhorting you today that we should all look beyond our life to the vision that God has put in us. Because God, I believe God has put things in us that are beyond just having our life sorted. You know, in Nehemiah's day, the Babylonian Empire had devastated most of the Middle East. It had, it had brought down nations, it brought down Israel, it brought down God's people, and they'd suffered. But not only God's people, many, many nations have been shaken by the Babylonian Empire. In our day, the coronavirus pandemic has shaken the whole world. Nowhere has anybody coped, really. It shut down, it's, it's killed thousands, hundreds of thousands. It's shut down economies. It's devastated countries. 
and it's not stopped. But I want to tell you, God has not been shaken. God has not been surprised. He is firm. And anything that is built on God as a foundation is not shaken. What I want to say is, if you found in this time you've really been shaken, your faith has been shaken, your peace or your joy has been shaken, there's an invitation to rebuild on a foundation that's firm. That's God. God is a firm foundation. And that's not, if, you're, if, if things in your life have been shaken, that's not God condemning you. That's God's invitation to rebuild on a foundation that's solid and firm. That's God and God's love and God's uh, saviour Jesus. He's the firm foundation. Nehemiah is a story of rebuilding on a good foundation, the foundation of God. And there'll be much more that we say about that in, in the next weeks. As a, as a church, we have an opportunity where everything's changed to rebuild, make sure as we build, we make sure we're on a found, firm foundation of God, of his love, his, his care for us. But we have an opportunity to show to the world what it is to be built on a firm foundation. And the world needs that. I don't know what that will look like, but I want to call on us as a church to have a vision for a church built on a firm foundation that is Jesus Christ and rebuild firmly on that foundation and show to the world beyond what it is that as the world rebuilds after this pandemic it can look to the church and say that's how we want to rebuild that's the people that are not shaken because they're built on God amen so this is going to be a great series where we're looking at not just rebuilding our lives if they own lives if they need rebuilding but going beyond to live for something that's beyond us so I want to pray I want to pray if you've not feel that in some way your life's not been built on a good foundation because it's been shaken that you find that maybe you are a Christian maybe you're not a follower of Jesus I want to pray I'll give you a chance to pray right now take a, 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 an opportunity to make a decision to follow Jesus and build your life on his foundation Jesus died on a cross to take away your sin to give you a new start the cross is, a, is God saying, you, sins can be forgiven, you can have a new start. And then I want to pray for us all. If you, if you want to make that step this morning, just, just uh, pray with me. Father God, I know that I've not been uh, following you in my life. I want to make a decision right now to follow you. Thank you for sending Jesus to take away my sins so I can have my life built on your foundation. That's what I want now. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And Father, I also want to pray for everybody watching. If, if there's been things exposed in our life where we're, we've been shaken and we realize we're not built on a foundation, we want to, to ask you, Holy Spirit, to teach us how to build on a foundation that is firm. And we ask, Lord, that you give us a vision and inspire us to take responsibility to rebuild not only our own lives, but the church and the kingdom in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I think we're back over to Andrew and Karis now. Uh, that was a fantastic word, I think, really challenging. I think there's something in there for all of us. Um, I was particularly at the beginning, Tim said that he had a sorted life that was interrupted by God, and that just... Um, we need to be open over the coming weeks as we hear these messages to have our sorted lives interrupted by God. He wants us to chase after him more, be more centered, more, reach out more, grow more, connect more. He's got so much in store for us as a, a group of churches and we need to be prepared to have our sorted lives interrupted. And I was just thinking as Tim was preaching right near the end about, and he was saying about rebuilding, that there are people out there who think it's too late to rebuild, and it isn't. Um, it, I don't know why you think that, 
But I just believe that God wants you to know it is not too late to rebuild with him. He's got you. He's on your side. And he can lead you on the pathway of rebuilding and putting his foundations deep in him. So don't give up and don't think you're past it because God's on your side. And he's telling you this morning, you can do this. I can rebuild you and I can make you different and I can make you stronger and I can make you all that I intended you to be. Amen. It's great that God has a plan and a purpose for each of our lives. He has a plan for your life and your life has a purpose. And I'm just really excited about this new series as as we begin perhaps to rediscover what that purpose is um, and take confidence or confidence that God has got a purpose for your life, that you're important to the kingdom that you're an integral part of what God is doing on the earth right now, whether it's with your family, whether it's with your friends, whether it's with church, whether it's something greater. It's it's important that you discover that vision because there is something incredible for you to do every day. Don't let the lies of the enemy say that um, that you're nothing, that you're insignificant, that you're not insignificant, that you're qualified that God has a purpose for you right now. He has a purpose for you today and tomorrow and the day after. And let's never forget that, that we are people of significance, not of ourselves, but of Christ in us, the hope of the world, that you carry the hope of the world. We were reminded, we were listening to something yesterday, um, which was talking about salt on your meal. You know, we we are to flavor the meal. We are to flavor the earth with the goodness and with the grace of God. It's no good the salt being on the side of the plate. We've got to get involved in the every day, in the school gate, in the colleagues at work. Wherever we are, we take that hope and that message of the gospel. It's amazing what an opportunity we have. Come on, church. We can do this. Um, as part of that, we're... Um, Tim mentioned our four pillars, and one of them was connect, and the way that we connect together. Um, This week and ongoing, we're looking to do this meet out to help out. So if you're feeling a little bit vulnerable and a little bit on your own, and you'd really welcome a visit or a phone call or or just somebody to come and walk alongside you, then do contact us at the office, uh, admin at CLCH. And that would be really good because we've got volunteers looking to come out to help out, to meet up with you and to pray with you. And if, you, if you're you available to pray for people too, contact us so that we can do that. This is family. This is church. This is what it's about. Um, if somebody comes to mind during the day and you think, oh, I'd like to pray for them, well, why don't you give them a call? Why don't you text them? Uh, why don't you make contact with us and we can link you up together. But listen to the Holy Spirit who is speaking, who is active in you. Because you have the mind of Christ, you have the heart of God within you. Uh, Don't forget to give. We're still taking offerings uh, at this time. You can give online uh, or on Facebook still now or through gift. Uh, But please support the work that we've got here. There's so much that we need to do. There's so much that we want to do. And we need funds. We need the finance of the kingdom to be able to do that. So please carry on doing that. And a big thank you to people because I know that you've been really, um, really good during this pandemic for that. Last final notice, prayer tonight. Uh, We have church prayer that kicks off tonight. Um, Guys, prayer is so fundamental to the kingdom of God. God calls us to be influencers of this world. And he says in his word that he will only work where two or three gather together in his name and pray. And he will work through prayer. So I want to really encourage you, come along tonight and pray Let's pray for for renewed vision, for renewed hope. Let's pray for our nation. But also, let's pray for one another. There's circumstances and situations that that some are going through at the minute, and we really need to knuckle down together and to pray God's blessing and hope into those situations. Um, We're connecting together. Uh, You're not an island, that you're part of this body of Christ, and we together move forward together. Um, So let's meet together tonight, 7 o'clock. Let's pray for each other. Uh, Oh, and there's one more final, final announcement. Uh, We've got the cafe after church. If you want to log into that and meet up and just connect and just talk through, maybe you could talk through perhaps some of the visions and the dreams that God's given you that maybe you've let go. But, you know, let's reignite that flame. Let's reignite that purpose. It's been really good this morning. Do you want to close in prayer? 
Father, thank you that you're a God who speaks and you speak today and you keep on speaking to us. And Father, we want to be a church that listens and we want to be a church that responds. We don't want to just ha be given words and visions. We want to be those that rise up to the challenge. Father, we thank you that we know that you equip us, you prepare us, you go alongside us, you go in front of us, you go behind us. So Father, we want to be those that rise up and take hold of this challenge. Father, we want to be excited by all you're going to do in us and through our church. We just praise you and bless you. You're an awesome God, and we're so grateful that we get to be in relationship with you. Amen. God bless you, and don't forget Church Cafe, and have a great day, have a great week. Remember, God has gone before you already. Amen. <laughs>